the lead attorneys um, helping to facilitate today with me is I'm Keila DPR, I'm the lead social worker for the program. And Cleva. <laughs> I'm Cleva Hubbard, I'm the parent mentor coordinator for the program. Thank you. Um, just so that we know everybody who is attending, if you could please enter your name and email address in the chat box um, as a way for us to keep track of that. Um, Uh, the second thing is, uh, just as an announcement, is please remember to, after the session, complete our post-session feedback and reflection form. Uh, Jen will put that link in the chat box so that you can copy it from there. Um, but th this has become particularly important for us now. Now that we're implementing in our, as, as part of our grant, um, we do need to be tracking uh, how we're doing with these trainings. So it's, it's important for our funding source that we get those um, session feedback session, uh, post session feedback and, and reflection forms completed by as many as possible. So we really appreciate that. Um, so today's workshop is appropriate language for child welfare cases. Um, our workshop today is presented by Wendy Lindebrink Allison, MSW, MBA, MCPSS. Um, Ms. Lindenberg Allison earned both a Master's of Business Administration and a Master's degree in Social Work from New Mexico Highlands University in 2018. Prior to that, she earned a BA in Sociology and Communication and followed that with Substance Abuse Studies at the University of New Mexico. Ms. Lindenberg Allison is currently the Program Manager for the New Mexico Crisis and Access line of, pro of protocol services. As a social worker, certified peer support worker, prevention trainer, and behavioral health advocate, she works to promote advocacy, assist community initiatives, and empower people that experience physical, mental, behavioral, and or substance uh, use disorders. Um, as uh, I'm gonna turn it over to her um, to screen share and go through her PowerPoint. Just remember that you do have chat if you have questions um, while she's doing her presentation or after, feel free to put them in the chat box. Okay, welcome, um, Wendy, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you. I'm so um, happy to be invited to be a part of your group today. Just so that um, I set the stage for how I um, normally present, I just want to let you know that I do ask for you guys to be active um, in the conversation while we are presenting this today so is that we can get some examples of some of the places where you are at um, throughout this presentation. And so if does everybody have the ability to unmute and mute their phones during this presentation? They should, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I just want to ground myself in understanding exactly who I'm speaking with today. So those that are present with us today, what is your uh, background, you know, I don't need a full introduction from everybody, but are we mostly social workers that work in the, uh, court system or are you um, what what are most people um, that are here today so it's a combination of social workers who work in an interdisciplinary parent representation program attorneys that work in that program and then um, workers from UIC oh, and, parent and parent mentors that work in our program Beautiful. Well, I think this presentation will be good for everybody within that background. And so let's go ahead and get started. And I'm here today to talk with you guys about recovery friendly language and thinking about the power of words. And we bring this to you today because the power of words is so incredible. All of a sudden, my screen's not sharing. Okay. Um, as the language we use represents um, the meanings we've constructed from our experiences. It shows people our attitudes, our expectations, our values, and how we'll act upon different things when we encounter different experiences within the community and in our familial system. It reflects um, unconditional positive regard for people when we're speaking in a recovery-friendly manner, but too often when we don't speak in a recovery-friendly manner, it begins to show our biases, our stigmas, and this comes from our learned behaviors. And we do this so subconsciously that so often we don't realize that we're doing it and we don't realize the unintentional impact that we have upon people. So as we get started in this presentation, I just want to start with reviewing what is 
the difference between stigma and self-stigma um, to ground us with moving forward in this conversation. So according to Webbs and Merriam, the definition of stigma is a set of negative and often unfair beliefs about a person, a group of people, or a society which a person may have or perceive about another person or group of people. It's commonly, commonly related to culture, gender, race, intelligence, and health, which includes all uh, concepts of health, physical, mental, and behavioral. So when we talk about stigma, what are some things that you guys hear that you feel portray stigma within our community? <laughs> Anybody want to speak up? So I can give an example. I have one. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So one of the stigmas that um, I've seen is that all parents' treatment plans need to be the same. And as far as reaching out to them is the same. Trying to have contact with them. It's like, well, I'm just going to call and be done with it. So that and if, if they show up, they show up. If they don't, they don't. So that stigma of not having that willpower to continuously contact them or even consider the fact that maybe they're at work or anything else. And it's more of an unfair belief because it's like, well, if they wanted their kids back, they would answer the phone. It sounds like what you're saying too is also an approach where people are taking the time to treat them as an individual. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think in our work, probably I would say one of the fiercest ones that we deal with is uh, the, that this the kind of presumption that because somebody's children are in custody that they don't care about their kids. They don't, you know, that that thing of if you loved your kids, you wouldn't. And and that I think is is really one of the, the, I think I, that's really the most blatant and harmful ones that we see a lot. I think that's really powerful and thank you for sharing that, you know, um, and because that's a stigma that exists sometimes within the people that are serving people in your area, then it often comes across in the language that you use. And when we use that language unintentionally, most often, it then begins to um, feed into the person you're talking to and they begin self-stigmatizing themselves as a result. So self-stigma is the belief system that the person themselves has regarding themselves. It often occurs when a person internalizes those attitudes and those, um, those thoughts that they hear other people sharing with them. And it um, can confuse them into feeling bad or, or make them think that they are being bad when, or when they see themselves as their mental illness or their disability or their situation and not as a person experiencing a situation or a person that is diagnosed with a mental illness or a person that um, was born or uh, developed a disability. And so the self-stigma often eats away at people and, they're, and it depletes their self-esteem and impacts their self-efficacy. So where they feel like, well, you know, if everybody believes this, then how can I even succeed? And so that's why it's so important to think about um, the stigmas that we carry and how do we communicate when we are carrying those stigmas because it does impact how we can build and nurture relationships with people. So I want to talk with you guys today about learning language that embodies models and promotes recovery and encourages people to identify and utilize a people first strength based recovery friendly language. And to do this, we must each band together and promote language in a manner that supports a way to help overcome that stigma that we um, have and that self stigmatization that um, is then created as a result of negative messages that we hear, negative message that we think, negative self-talk that people have about themselves and others. And when we do this, we can foster hope and preserve dignity within people. So uh, 
to give an example of what I'm trying to reference here. So if somebody says, well, you must not care about your kid if you're not answering your call, then, you know, if you hear it enough, then people begin thinking, well, maybe I don't, don't care enough about my kid. Maybe, you know, I, I should make sure that I'm doing these things when, when then it then jeopardizes their opportunities to um, take that next step in their recovery because, uh, the example that you guys get, guys gave, you know, somebody can't always answer their phone when they're at um, um, their place of employment. And so they think, oh, I got to take this call. I got to risk losing my job because I don't want my social worker who is the holder of my child to think I don't care about my kid. But then if you lose your job, then you don't get to uh, regain custody of your child either. So it's kind of this never ending circle. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that we're speaking in ways that help foster nourishment for people and not make people feel bad when they're really trying to do the best that they can with the situation that they have as a result of their situation or their mental illness and, and often of their support system or lack of support system. So in order to begin thinking about doing this, we begin by thinking about using strength-based language. And so when we're using strength-based language, we're offering people hope, we're offering people empowerment, and we're promoting positive uh, change, positive influence. So um, we, we consider, instead of saying the word, um, so what's the problem? Why can't you answer your phone whenever I call you? You might want to instead say, you know, I understand that you might be experiencing some challenge, challenges when I call you not being able to answer your phone. How can I help you overcome that challenge? And the word um, problem makes it uh, seem as if it's an inconvenience and something that will never go away. Uh, however, when you use the word challenge, people tend to associate that word with an obstacle that can be overcome. And if you overcome that challenge, you feel accomplished. So when I offer that as the example, what are some other words that you guys um, use within your communities and your engagements with people that we don't realize potentially um, are, are not strength-based language because it's become part of our repertoire and it's become uh, common and it's become socially acceptable to use some of that language. Can you guys think of any other words like that? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So uh, to me, the classic one in our field is using the word treatment plan instead of case plan. Treatment plan implies you've got a problem that needs to be treated. Case plan is what you need to do to get your children back. And it's really slow to get CYFD to change it. I'm always using the word case plan or the phrase, and even they still have documents that are, that are treatment plans. They, they won't even change their form. Well, that's a beautiful example. Are there any other examples out there? I was thinking um, one of the things that frequently gets said is what are the barriers to, to return home of the children instead of like you're saying, what are the challenges? What are the, what, what, what needs to happen in a positive way rather than um, citing what are the barriers as though that's going to prevent it from happening. That's a good one too. Do we have any other examples that anybody would like to share? I have a problem with this, and I don't know if this can be changed, but I have a huge problem when the mother is sitting in the meeting and she's titled as bio mom. And, and I don't know if that can be changed, but that's to me, that's an insult because you're pretty much labeling her, her level of being a parent to this child, but she's always been their mother. Mm -hmm. And so saying, oh, bio mom is here, foster mom is here, when it could be just like mom. You know, and, and I have a lot of mothers come to me like, why are they putting a label on who I am now? I think that that's a beautiful example of where the language that we use because it's become um, written within our documentation, the examples that you guys are sharing. Um, 
and, and we end up reading those things, we end up then um, commonplacing it rather than thinking about the impact that that has on the people that we're working with. Because just because it's written down doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we have to verbalize. And somebody else spoke up and asked if we could hear them, and, and I want to go ahead and allow them to, to share. In the, yeah, in the same context, uh, calling parents respondents instead of mother and father. Yeah, that's another really good example. So, so as a basis of, you know, thinking about how do we support and facilitate change, you know, we start from considering a strength-based language approach. And, ch and remember that change takes time. And if we encourage and we rec make recommendations to uh, promote considerations to change some of this documentation, then um, it gets easier because then when we're reading uh, something, we're able to read something that is a strength-based uh, opportunity rather than uh, reading uh, language that promotes uh, feelings of isolation, feelings of distance, feelings of um, hopelessness. And and even though it's going to take time to potentially change that, and sometimes the documentation may never change, um, we just need to be cognitive that just because that's how it's written doesn't mean that's how we need to um, conversate with it. And that's not how we have to talk with people regarding the, the, the environment that we're trying to assist people through. And so the next step to that would be considering a recovery-friendly language. Um, is um, one step further than strength-based. So recovery-friendly language supports an environment based on mutual respect and personal responsibility. So that goes to where I was talking about. Just because that's how it's written down on the document doesn't mean that I have to personally um, say those words when I'm talking with people. And when we think about um, creating a recovery-friendly language environment, we are facilitating and promoting a comfortable and safe space that focuses on wellness and on someone's um, opportunities for recovery rather than on the illness or the disability or the situation. So uh, we, when we model this communication, it supports advocacy, strength, and encouragement for people with uh, these lived mental health experiences and lived um, situations that they're going through and it reduces stigma and shame and it uh, helps support minimization of self-stigmatization that people experience. So we want to create a, a world of unconditional positive regard where we make people feel awesome about being people. And we can do this by thinking about the language we use. So the language we use should all be about respect, thinking about, is this how somebody um, should speak to me if I was in the situation? How would I feel if, if I was uh, in the reverse place as this person I'm um, communicating with? And, and sometimes, you know, because of the, the stigmatization that we carry unconsciously, we don't realize the impact that we're having. And um, an example is when we're venting or blowing off steam to our colleagues, it reflects our biases and it reflects how we really think about people. And so who you are in private is who you really are. And even though we try to present in a professional manner with people and in situations, um, those biases that we have in private are still within ourselves and within our psyche and within our language. And sometimes they accidentally slip through. So let's say you're sitting at McDonald's and you're talking to your colleague about a person that you're working with. And you say, their situation is just crazy. I just can't even believe that, you know, they um, 
are experiencing so many problems and, and, and they've gotten themselves into so many horrific situations and um, they um, are, are really seem to be trying to help somebody else, but they just, they keep on uh, hurting themselves and making the situation worse for them. So, you know, that, that, that shows that it, within that statement, there was a bunch of things that we could have said that if somebody was in McDonald's that overheard you um, could begin to in a, internalize those things because they, the language that we're using was not a recovery friendly delivery. And so we need to be aware of the impact our words have on ourselves, our attitudes, our presentation, and those around us. So a way to consider reframing that conversation would be um, the person that I'm working with is experiencing a lot of things right now. And it feels like the impact of the situations that they've experienced are are over could potentially be overwhelming and um, I'm really glad that I'm here to help them navigate through and show them alternatives so as that they can move to a different place and work through what they're experiencing now I said the exact same thing um, I didn't say I left out some things because um, you know, some things just don't need to be said. Um, and then I didn't um, put language out into the world that makes other people that overhear me uh, feel bad. And so when I was giving those two examples, could you guys hear in the first example where I was saying language that could be uh, potentially harmful for somebody else that overhears you? <laughs> so, so give me some other language that we say when we're venting or blowing off steam to friends and family members and colleagues that has become so common, so socially acceptable that we don't realize the harm that it has. Uh, do you guys have a couple of examples that you can share? This is a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the new ones that they're talking about in the motivational interviewing model actually is the use of the word resistance. Mm -hmm. They used to say clients were resistant and now they're not using that word because of the negative piece. What are some other ones? Or even in your documentation. I mean, maybe maybe you're, it's not your words but that you're saying to other people, but it's the words you're writing in your documentation and remembering that, you know, documents are public records that in the field that you work in that your clients have access to review and how would it make them feel if they were reviewing those documents? I'll hop in now too. Um, one example that comes to mind that really has negative connotations is the use of the word junkie or substance use. Um, you know, because it's a struggle, and I think that that really conveys a very negative perception of somebody who's just um, not wanting to improve. And I have not met a single individual who's struggling with substance abuse who does not want to leave that, that path. Beautiful example. Were there a hopeless case? <laughs> That that's um, that leaves people feeling as if they don't have opportunities to to achieve wellness and achieve positive outcomes. Anybody else have any examples of some language that they? I'm going to give you more examples. I just want to hear what you guys are thinking in this moment. <laughs> So words do matter, and they 
uh, reflect who we are and who we truly value. And so, you know, most people, they present themselves feeling like uh, a, a feline who um, uh, is quiet and reserved, but uh, on the inside, if we make people feel as if they're worthy and we're compassionate and we use recovery friendly language and we support people finding resiliency, then instead of making somebody feel like a stray cat, uh, we can make somebody feel inwardly like a lion. And so it's a matter of are your words making people feel as if they should be eating from the garbage? Or are your words making people feel as if they're eating like kings? Um, and, and, you know, when, when people have hope and people feel good about themselves and, and people are able to see the possibility of change, then they're more likely to move towards that change. Um, and, and the attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. And, and it is what makes us all great. And so we need to ensure that our language is empathetic, respectful, non-judgmental, non-stigmatizing. It's clear and understandable. It's free of jargon and confusing data. And, and when we're working with people who are experiencing concerns that they're working through, sometimes the jargon and the data and the speculation um, can be very hard for people to navigate through. And so we need to make sure that our language carries a sense of commitment, hope, and presents possibility that there is potential for an opportunity for a positive outcome. And for those social workers in the room, this probably looks really familiar to you all. And, um, uh, you know, we go through through life and we go through our professional environment and we go through our education and we continue to hear these things but sometimes um, when we hear them they don't always then translate into using them and so that's why I'm thankful to be here today to remind us that um, to use the language that we are encouraging people to um, feel wellness and feel respected and feel opportunistic. Because when we don't, we, we don't think about what else am I saying? How will someone read or hear this? Did I give a sense of commitment and hope? Or do I present with opportunity or a sense of pessimism? Do I convey an awareness and an expectation of recovery? Or do I convey a sense of, oh, here we go again. Uh, uh, well, you know, same old patterns, same old behaviors. Oh, uh, there's no opportunities for change. I, uh, and I put you in this box where I've labeled you, I've stigmatized you, and I've made assumptions about you. But, you know, just because you have seen this person before, possibly, doesn't mean that that person is in the same place. And people can and do change when they're given opportunities and they're given more education. And so a lot of times the people that we're working with that are experiencing uh, different obstacles that they are trying to um, navigate through, uh, every time they navigate through something, they gain strength and they gain a way of understanding that how do I prevent this from occurring again? How do I uh, facilitate um, bringing this into my every day rather than my every once in a while? And so um, think about when you guys uh, have thought about dieting in your lives. Um, for the everybody goes on some sort of diet at some point, right? And so a diet could be um, a relationship diet where you try to uh, improve the people that you're surrounded by or a diet can be uh, where you make different food choices or a diet could be where you create a healthier lifestyle for yourself and you're exercising or drinking more water and when you create these diet plans in your life um, it's not always easy to um, succeed when you first begin because there's a lot of other things that 
um, come along with making those changes in our lives. And so, um, you know, you have to think about, um, mm. can you afford a different meal plan? Do you have time to walk? Do you have other people in your life that, that you can support yourselves or are the people that you feel are negative in your lives, um, people that, that you have the opportunity to not have in your lives? And sometimes some people don't have the opportunity to not have negative people in their lives. So when they're trying to do relationship diets, they have to think about how can I how can I balance this relationship with this negative person that I can't not have in my life? And when I say that as an example, you know, think about your parents or your children and sometimes you know, your adult children, right? Um, sometimes um, those people are people that you have to maintain in your life because uh, I, of the relationship uh, that that is necessary to help support facilitating um, you through your personal um, journey. But it doesn't mean that we always have to feed into those things. And so when we're talking about the people that we're working with, um, how are we portraying and bringing our own baggage into the conversation uh, because um, of the experiences that we've had or we've seen other people have. And we're laying that upon them and giving them that heavy burden of, about, you know, well, um, I, I, and making assumptions that they can or, or cannot succeed as a result of those burdens that we're placing upon them. Anybody have any thoughts on that? So that that burden that we're placing upon them in this conversation is the language that we're using. So there's a difference between positive versus negative language. So we've given a few examples already about some of the negative language, but what are some other examples of negative language that you guys um, want to uh, share with the group in regards to the specific? I would say um, the term you are X, Y, Z. That's negative because then that's, that's a type of judgment in my eyes and a type of stereotype regardless of what the situation is. For example, you are an addict. Um, that, that's, to me, that sounds negative. Instead of saying more of you're dealing with substance use. Beautiful. What are some other negative ways that we portray um, our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs about experiences people encounter? Or how they were born, or how they present? Well, I think it's, it still amazes me um, with all the sort of trainings we've had because I still hear even clinicians uh, reference individuals with diagnosis language first, schizophrenics, borderlines, substance abusers, right? That, that it really is not person-centered language. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Could you give an example of that? of how I would change that negative into a positive. Right. So um, just like Chrissy was saying, I would say it's a person who is experiencing a diagnosis of um, depression. It's a person who is diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's a person who is um, experiencing uh, substance use that they're having a hard time um, controlling their usage and as a result it's negatively impacting their environment and their their self and those around them 
the thing that I always share about recovery friendly language is it seems like it takes five more words to say things than it does in our non recovery friendly language environment. And I think that's sometimes why some of this negative language has become so commonplace in our environment because people feel this need to fast track and fast food everything and, and create shortcuts for everything that we and uh, don't stop to slow down to think about the impact that the words that we're saying have because we have to hurry up and get on to the next thing or we have to hurry up and get through this conversation and if we can stop and just make sure that we're treating people with dignity and and giving people a few more seconds to maybe communicate with a few more positive uh, words within that conversation, uh, we will leave that encounter in a much better place. I think that's what I mean by an example is uh, you, you've talked about the diagnosis, but tell me the difference between the negative and positive way to address that with language that you're talking about. So then um, here's some negative language that we hear people um, using very um, very freely, right? Oh, they're so emo, they're lazy. Um, I gave you the example earlier of what in McDonald's, that person, the situation is so crazy, or I've had a crazy day, right? They, um, and these are not, these are horrible. Some of these words are horrible to have to read, but sometimes there are some people out there that still use some of these words, and so that's why they are up here. Um, you know, like they're a felon, they're smelly, they're ugly, they are dangerous, uh, they're imbeciles. Um, and a, a way to reframe the, whoops. Ah. Hold on, my computer's going haywire, one second. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, a way to, uh, reframe is just to always identify people as people first you know my name is Wendy um, and I am a person with lived experience and I have struggled with depression and anxiety in my lifetime and when I was not in a well place I was using substances to manage my behaviors in a way that was um, not supportive to those around me or myself and um, I have been able to find the courage to overcome the challenges that I've experienced and learn new ways to uh, handle experiences in my life and as a result I have um, been able to make remarkable changes in my life. So, you know, there's an example of a way to positively say language, whereas well, if I'm saying those same things in a negative space, um, I could say, when I was in my 20s, I was a druggie and, and I, um, you know, had, had a lot of tragedies going on and I participated in risky behavior and you know some of the things I did were, could have been considered unethical and it made me a very ugly person you know that that's a negative way of saying what I said first as a positive um, example um, and so it's like that self-fulfilling prophecy if you if you yourself identify with those negative terms or you hear other people identifying you with those negative terms then you begin to believe those negative terms and it creates a heavy weight upon you whereas if you use the positive language then it offers hope and it offers opportunities for people to say that I am a good person I can overcome I um, am able to uh, be extraordinary and so um, you know that's the difference between if we frame things in a negative way or if we frame things in a positive way and, and sometimes people say things in a negative way because it's a way they feel of building connection with people and talking with people at the level that they're presenting at but we are not modeling positive um, 
behaviors in that way when we step down and replicate um, people in the negative language. And I offer that as an example because when I talk with people that like work in JJS and work um, in the in the or in the prison system right and they say well you know if i if i if i don't talk like that then they they say oh you don't get it you don't get it and and you know you don't have to um show people that uh that you're able to talk the same way as them and and be in that space with them because that's not where you want them to be and we want to show them that this is where we want to help you to consider moving to. Does that uh, answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes, I, and I think I'm really guilty of this, is from, from the bench, I, I'm saying that somebody's being irresponsible, you know, and that uh, you need to stop that risky behavior because you're going to lose your children and i'm not sure quite. maybe it's just i'm not sure how to be nice about it maybe maybe the judge is not necessarily supposed to because i want to try to scare somebody enough to change their behavior um and i don't know i, I really don't because I, I tend to do exactly what you're saying and i need to work on that and it does take time to change. And you can still say the things that you're saying in a way without using the words that you were just sh sharing with us. And so uh, when somebody, you, you offered the example as you're, you're being irresponsible and you're participating in risky behavior. So uh, let me move forward. Um, uh, how about this one non non-compliant for example you're being non-compliant with the, the the thing that you're um whereas it's somebody who has a different opinion about um the choices that they're making and they um are sometimes thinking about ideas that um are working for them and um and don't understand how they can find a different solution. I think that's a very bad example of how I was trying to to help support a different conversation with your with your example. So, um, so for instance, risky behavior. Uh, instead of saying risky behavior, the behaviors that you're experiencing, uh, or that you're the behaviors that you're engaging in, are creating. Um, a sense of of a sense of fear for other people and yourself and and when we have fear existing in our on our environment it creates a space where um i'm not certain that you know we can have other people involved with with those particular um, outcomes and it, and when you think about trying to think about creating a safe space for for people then then you can uh, create opportunities where people can um, thrive does that help or did I just confuse it more no that's exactly that's exactly right I, perfect example is uh, last week, I had someone who was living in their car. They're now testing positive. They were ready for a trail home visit, and now that's not happening. And uh, I was about to let into her with all of these things. You're going to lose your kids. You know, this is, you know, you got to think about what you're doing because you know, this is going in a bad direction. And Tanya Tijerina was there. And in a few minutes, she did exactly what you're saying. Made this woman feel better. Said all the same things I was going to say, but 
had her walk away uh, out of the room feeling better, being maybe more positive and able to shoulder that burden that she has put on herself, the weight of all of what she's done. And it worked. So I, I understand. Well, thank you. I mean, and and I understand the the fear factor, but when we leave people with hope in situations, people are more likely to try to continue to find that feeling that they have when you leave them hopeful and to maintain that feeling of hope that we offer to them rather than if we make people feel bad, then when people feel bad, then they that's when they begin to think about, well, how can I make myself feel better in this moment? And, and you know, don't have the ability maybe to think about this moment then impacts um, the next moment because they are, their cognitive state is impaired. And as a result of their cognitive state being impaired, they don't have the ability to often think about the consequences of the actions of making myself feel better in this moment will then have a trickle effect. And so um, if we can offer opportunities for people to feel like hopeful and to chase that hope and that dream rather than chase that I just need to drown my sorrows and I need to just, you know, figure out a way to get through today and today I need to numb the pain because I can't, I can't bear having my children with me. And so that's why people continue to participate in negative behavior sometimes because they just feel hopeless in a lot of those situations. Um, so we need to stop and applaud successes. And we need to, you know, uh, think about uh, not just disciplining people um, with the, the actions, but, um, saying you've done this really great and I'd like to see us get to a place where we continue to see you um, uh, succeeding in this opportunity so is that we can create um, pathways for you to uh, find a way to regain custody of your children. Okay. And, and I, also then the, that, I also feel that when you use recovery based language it's a person to process it more instead of because if someone is at you in a manner and they're lecturing you, you have the you have the choice to say, well, they did X, Y, Z to me. So now they've taken that that lecture and, and turned it towards you. This is why I responded because this is what he said. Mm -hmm. But if recovery base is more of a process and they can hold themselves accountable and walking out with their hand held high, it's more of like I understand what I did and I know the consequences to my actions instead. Yeah. I don't care. He shouldn't have said this, this to me, or she shouldn't have said that, and just excusing the fact of what led to that conversation here. Just developing the language. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I need to do. So I think about it like this. The language that I'm using, is it an invitation for people to want to walk through the door with me, or is it the is it language that's closing the door and people um, are feeling limited and don't know how to access what's on the other side. So whenever I promote recovery friendly language, I always think about I'm the keeper of this gate. And am I am I creating a world where people want to walk through this door to facilitate change uh, in themselves and in others? Or am I creating an obstacle which makes people think, how do I get through this door? Uh, <laughs> when we think about how we're using language think about when you go to a restaurant and you have a wonderful experience the food was delicious the service was terrific the price was 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 not too bad right um but uh, not horrible not terrific but not horrible right so we leave there, we feel good about things, right? We exude positive uh, energy to other people that we encounter. But do we tell them that, um, we tell very few people about that positive engagement we just had at the restaurant. 
But when we go to a restaurant and the food wasn't very good, the service was horrible, the the pricing was was gouged and um, outrageous, uh, we tell ten people about that, right? And so when when we are trying to use uh, recovery friendly language, the more people that are using the recovery friendly language, the more uh, opportunities for other people to hear it will come into our environment and more people will use it. So when you, the example of the restaurant, if you were to tell somebody about the positive experience you, you had at that restaurant, more people are likely to go to that restaurant. But when you tell people the negative experience that you had at the restaurant, um, people are more are are not willing to go to that restaurant and we tell more people about our negative experiences than we do about our positive experiences and so we have to be really cognitive about thinking about um, the positive language that we use because for every article on human strength there's 500 on illness so we can always find something wrong with something but we need to find a way to find the positive because it's really easy to, to point out all the things we're doing wrong. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to see the light in something that somebody's doing right. So going back to this clinical versus recovery focus, you know, it, rather than thinking about somebody who's decompensating, it's somebody who's having a bad, we can consider saying it's somebody who's having a bad day or um, a person who is, uh, is or is not experiencing something. Instead of saying a consumer, a client, or a case, it's a person receiving services or a person I'm working with or a person who, who is being provided services. Um, and rather than a frequent flyer, which we hear in not only the hospital system, but the court systems as well, right? Somebody who uh, comes through your system um, a lot and you see more than you would prefer to see them. <laughs> um, it's somebody who's making the choice to live the way that they feel works best for them. And they're trying again and they're seeking support. They're there because they are seeking support. They just don't know how to seek support in a positive way. They don't know how to ask for help. And that's because that's the way they've been taught. So think about the behaviors that you have. Somebody showed you how to do that. When, when the people that are you're working with, somebody showed them how to respond, how to act, and how to manage things in those ways that uh, most people... Um, uh, try to make choices to say this is not the way I want to be but I don't know another way and so for instance um, when I was a youth and for those of you that don't know a peer support specialist which was part of my credentialing is a person with lived experience in recovery from their own mental health diagnosis so not only am I a social worker but I am a person in recovery myself um, so the examples that I've shared when I've identified it as personal are truly my examples of my life. And um, so when I was a youth, my mom saw that I was struggling and her way of navigating through her struggles was to drink and smoke marijuana. So when I got to uh, an age where she felt as if I was appropriate to be able to handle those things, uh, which in her opinion was at age 12, she said, you're struggling here, come drink with me. Here, let's go get high together. Um, and those were her words, right? And, and so that's how I learned how to manage my mental health concerns is with drugs and alcohol because that's what my mom taught me to do. So when people are coming to you, they're, they're working through things because that's how they've been taught how to work through things. It wasn't until I was an adult and I started uh, learning that there were other ways to work through things and that that's not the choice that I had to make. And just because that's the choice she made and she showed me how to make didn't mean that that was the choice I had to continue to make. And that's a hard place to be when the everybody around you is participating in that negative behavior and you have to step out of that environment it's a very lonely place and not everybody has the strength to be able to step into that other place where 
um, there's nobody else participating in these behaviors because sometimes you might be the only one not participating in those behaviors. And if that's your support system and you are um, in need of having their help to help you with um, living because you don't have any money, you don't have any place else to live, and that's your only option, sometimes it's hard to maintain resiliency when you're living in the place where you learn how to uh, engage in those behaviors in the first place. So we just have to continue to offer hope to people. We have to continue to understand that the situations that people experience um, are sometimes all that they know. And it's up to us to show them that there's a different option and that there's a different way. And, you know, people don't know what they don't know. So, um, so we have to give them examples of how they can um, move to something. And we do that with with providing hope and with providing language that doesn't make people feel as if they are uh, stigmatized, which then leads into that self-stigmatization that we talked about in the beginning. Sometimes when people are acting entitled, it's because that's the front they've had to put up. Um, that's how they've had to uh, learn how to survive. If I show my weaknesses, then people take advantage of me. And so sometimes when people act entitled, it's not that they actually fee feel like they deserve something more. It's that when they don't show that they um, are um, deserving of things, then people have taken advantage and taken from them things. Um, when people are dangerous or aggressive or hostile, um, and those are the clinical words over here, right? That we're, I'm trying to encourage you to think about different ways to, to, to think about addressing those words. Um, there are often people who are struggling with something that makes them feel as if they don't care about themselves or others. And they um, don't care about the consequences anymore of um, what happens as a result of their behaviors because um, they feel like they're in a hopeless place. And uh, somebody who appears clinically unmotivated, right, rather than saying that somebody is unmotivated to participate in their, their, their plan that we've uh, worked with them to uh, try to accomplish, we might say, well, what is not inspiring you about what has been presented to you? Um, because maybe they're unmotivated because they um, are either unable to participate in the plan, they're bored and they don't feel challenged by the plan, maybe they're over-medicated um, as a result of um, the plan that you're on, and so uh, and they just don't have the ability to facilitate change. Questions on these words? And I did have a handout that I think I shared with you all. Did um, we can find out? And if uh, if we do have it, we can email it out to yeah. everybody. Okay. If you don't have it, I'll just go ahead and be it proactively send it to the. Um, to you all when I am done here. So that way you can share it with each other. And um, it just, it lists all these things out. So is that, you know, I'm pulling out a couple to talk about here, but that way you have it to reflect on and to think about uh, maybe using this word instead of this word. Um, it's Cause as you can see, there's a lot. <laughs> and um, there's 45 examples that I've, I've offered for you guys to consider. And I want it to, to help us think about this in this way. When we're using clinical words, we don't realize the impact that the clinical word has. So for instance, this minion is saying, run for your lives, right? And this minion over here is saying, what he means is running is good for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
So he's talking about being heart healthy, but it sounds as if he's in a panic and saying, run for your life. <laughs> so when we are promoting uh, people's first strength-based recovery friendly language, we're encouraging people to participate in their community. We're offering a hopeful perspective. Uh, we're um, communicating language that's strength-based and, and offers changes in self-perception. Uh, culture of healing. It's things that we have to self-monitor and we have to self-manage. Uh, we're not here to be the language police and say, oh, you really shouldn't say it like that, honey. You know, we, we model what we want other people to say and we promote support from multiple sources and we circle ourselves with other people that have a similar language that we want to replicate. So on, um, uh, as we close up here, we want to move recovery forward because it can make us all great and think about uh, the words that we're using when we're venting and blowing off steam and how that um, potentially impacts others because recovery is a journey undertaken by people with lived experience. And when we uh, focus on recovery oriented practices, uh, we support people in their individual recovery journey, and we're using language that promotes communication, makes people feel safe, and encourages conversations about their own uh, care and their own treatment and their own um, engagements that they have. And, and so do we have any uh, final questions in these last couple of minutes? It's 111, and I know we're going to 115. I have a uh, trial I have to go to, but I would like more examples of the language I could practice. Uh, and so I don't know if you know what I want to do. We'll get it to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you being here. And when we're effectively communicating, we are being. So just remember, is the language I am promoting um, a way to help people be uh, positive, be genuine, and be aware? Because when we start treating people like people, they become people. Some Too often times we look at people and we see their illness, we see their situation, we see their circumstances, and we don't see the person inside. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you guys today. If you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to me and I'm more than happy to connect with you all. And like I said, I will share um, the handout that I have that reflects those um, statements I was talking about. And um, I'm not one to, to hoard information. So please do share the presentation, share the handouts that I have and, and help create a recovery friendly environment for all of us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we do have uh, essentially a resource library for these presentations um, where we keep them so people can access them and we'll also email to, to the participants as well. And we really appreciate this information. It's definitely very um, necessary and relevant to the work that we do. So we really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk with us today. Um, just a reminder for everybody else, please do uh, 